Well, good evening. It's great to see this uh, turnout this evening, and I really am, am thrilled to uh, welcome you to SFU for what promises to be a very stimulating uh, evening of uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Andrew Petter. I'm the president of Simon Fraser University. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are privileged uh, to be gathered on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, not only in this campus, but in all three of our campuses throughout uh, Greater Vancouver. Well, it's a real pleasure to kick off uh, the 2014-15 President's Faculty Lecture Series uh, this evening. The President's Faculty Lecture Series uh, is a series that became part of our commitment to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. We really want to be a university that contributes to the community in every way we possibly can. And, of course, one way we can do that is to bring to the community some of the outstanding researchers and uh, academics who are doing really exciting work, uh, bring them out of their labs and out of their classrooms and into the community to share their knowledge and to interact with people in the community. And it's an opportunity for them to meet uh, community members and to hear perspectives that they might not hear uh, within the university. And it's an opportunity for the community to benefit in yet another way from uh, the activities and contributions of what I do believe is uh, Canada's engaged university, Simon Fraser University. Now, there will be a chance to ask questions and offer, offer comments after the lecture. And uh, after that, we'll also have an opportunity to stay back. And, uh, and Professor Pei has kind, kindly agreed to uh, stay back for a few minutes. And there'll be some refreshments at the back, modest refreshments, but, uh, but uh, an opportunity to have some casual conversation amongst ourselves and also to ask some questions uh, of our, uh, our speaker this evening. And also please note that the lecture is uh, being filmed so that it can be uh, shared through the SFU YouTube channel. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker, who is uh, Dr. Jian Pei. Uh, Dr. Pei is a professor of computing science. And something that you may not know, but I want you to know, is that SFU is a world leader in computing science. We were recently ranked in the top 50 computing science schools in the world at Simon Fraser University. And one of the reasons for that is Dr. Pei and his colleagues. But Dr. Pei in particular, let me tell you, is uh, one of the world's leading experts in data mining, in database research, and in large-scale data analysis. I'm really excited uh, that Dr. Pei agreed to be the kickoff lecturer for, uh, for this series. Um, big data and its applications are becoming increasingly uh, important topics of conversation, opening up opportunities to better analyze data on the healthcare front, a financial front, whatever it may be. Big data and the analysis of big data sets are increasingly becoming uh, the way in which we are starting to uncover uh, truths that may not have been available before and look for new solutions to longstanding problems and, and chart the way forward. Um, so much so, in fact, that SFU has recently created a, a master's in big data management with Dr. Pei as one of the distinguished faculty members delivering that program. And that, again, builds on the strength that we have in computing science and particularly in data management. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Pei's uh, research. Over the past several years, uh, he has focused on developing effective and efficient ways to analyze and capitalize upon the vast stores of data housed in applications such as social networks, network security informatics, healthcare informatics, business intelligence, and web searches. His work has been lauded and supported by industry and by government and, of course, uh, by our university. Professor Pei is a prolific and widely cited author. Last year, Microsoft Academic Search placed him in the top 10 authors in the world in the field of data mining. So you really have the opportunity to uh, hear a world leader this evening. And uh, as befits a world leader, he has received many prestigious awards. I cannot possibly name them all, but a few are the fellow of, he is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He's a senior member and distinguished speaker of the Association of Computing Machinery. Uh, and of course, we are so proud that he is a member of uh, the Faculty of uh, Computing Science in uh, Simon Fraser University. I should say the Faculty of Applied Science, but in Computing Science at Simon Fraser University. The Dean will get cross at me if I get the faculty name wrong. So please join with me, without further ado, in uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Jean Pei, our guest speaker this evening. Dr. Pei. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for the very uh, nice introduction, and um, it is my great honor to be uh, to speak here. And, and uh, uh, thank you for coming. And I know because you are coming, so the verdict decided to roll back a little bit into the summer. <laughs> okay, so we are talking a very hot topic, big data. And well, big data is about size, is about velocity, meaning um, you know, data comes and goes very fast. And it's about variety, we see all kinds of different data, and we see uh, the uh, business is interested in the value of data, and also um, you hear more complaints about data quality than uh, you know, what can be used. Yeah. Okay, so that's the velocity of the things. And one important uh, uh, mention we learned from uh, big data, and uh, I mean, people uh, like to use those uh, terms starting with we, to say big data. And in fact, I want to uh, pass the first message to the audience is that Vancouver, and it happens as a we there, <laughs> has a very strong base of big data. And I will uh, tell you more story about uh, our research uh, related to big data and also how we work with the community uh, in, uh, in BC, in the Vancouver area to develop uh, useful applications. Okay. By the way, uh, this picture, in fact, is SFU uh, campus, uh, Burnaby campus. Beautiful. Okay, so let's try to understand a little bit about uh, the size, the velocity, the complexity of uh, big data. And this is uh, one statistics uh, just available earlier this year. You can see uh, that there, we take social networks as one uh, particular example. We can see there are uh, quite a few uh, popular social networks uh, around us. And surprisingly, if we only pick the top 21 social networks, then we will cover 5.7 billion users' uh, profiles combined together. And if you think about the population in the world, then we have only 7.2 billion people in this group. And if we count the number of users, it's 5.2 billion. I mean, of course, one person may have multiple accounts, but still a huge number, right? And if you look at it, we know that 34.3% uh, of world's population have internet access. And you can see the uh, social networks and the data floating on the network really connect all of us. What's the definition of big data? Well, many people have many definitions. Okay, and uh, people uh, on the one hand use all those we's to say, what's it? Uh, to, uh, but in fact, this is uh, one of the cutest definition of big data. It is really something people now are going for because it carries the most, the fun, uh, most fun part of our you know, era and of our time and it connects so many things. Let me ask you one question. Is big data really new? Uh, well, to many people, the, the immediate answer, yeah, it's pretty new one year or two. But if you go back a little bit to literature, for example, to look at the oldest book in our history, big data is not that new. Because in Bible it says, I'm with you and we watch over you whenever you go. What does that mean? That means someone is observing and collecting every bit of the data to some extent, right? And you can find that in other uh, uh, you know, literature, in other uh, different parts of the world. Okay, and what's the difference between the old days and the new days that make data so prominent nowadays? Well, the critical difference is the data access. In the old days, people cannot access most of the, big data, most of the data, right? You only live uh, within a very constrained scope for technical reasons, for all kinds of different uh, constraints. But now we have more and more access to a much larger and larger data set. Uh, so collect different aspects of information. That makes a huge difference. If, I would, if I'm asked to give an example to explain how big data comes together, 
This is a good example. Okay? So this is the installation of Pope Benedict in year 2005. You can see people are you know, listening to the, um, uh, were listening to the uh, speech quietly, and there were only a small number of people using those uh, cell phones to make some pictures. This is the inter installation uh, in year 2013. And the culture changed. People started to no, not trust our eyes. They use all kinds of equipment to record the uh, ceremony, and then they watch it and upload it to the um, internet. Okay. So you can see the critical difference is that with the advancement of technology, people's living style, the culture, completely change. And everyone becomes so proactive, so eager to collect data, to contribute their own bit into this big data era. So that leads to my belief in the big data. Yes, those volume, velocity, variety, veracity, value, they are important. They are technical uh, characteristics of big data. However, the most important thing for big data is to connect people with data. And any of those specific technical challenges uh, can be tackled in one way or the other. But if we don't work on connecting data with people, data is still data. It won't be useful. Okay? And when we said connecting data with people, what I mean is really two things. One thing is that we need to enable uh, popular accessibility, meaning we need to encourage and enable second use of data. I will tell you more about that. Well, when data is collected, people may carry some purpose of collecting the data. But when people use it, the data may be used in some other way for some other purposes. Okay? That's the whole uh, source to drive the big data uh, you know, uh, in industry. And also, we need to enable people to connect data from multiple sources, from different sources. The complexity, in fact, is the source of the uh, you know, um, fun part of big data. If you can only access one part of the uh, one source, well, you may not be able to do much. But if you can connect different things together, you can do much more. And another thing is we uh, need to um, you know, give people, we need to unlock the capability of analyzing big data. This means the background knowledge. This means different tools so that people can use to you know, um, make good use of big data. So in order to connect data with people, one important thing is that we need to understand the context where the data is used. Let me give you a concrete example. Suppose I live in Vancouver, but let's say I'm traveling for a few days. Okay? And when I ask a question, so suppose I'm using a, a web search engine. Let's say I give a query, say, coffee shop. Well, you immediately can guess. The context is likely I just need some coffee to wake me up. And then the good answer should be some coffee shop close to my current location. No matter where you are from, I don't care. But if I ask another question is a home renovation. And unlikely someone goes to some place for a few days, uh, buy a house there and do renovation. The chance is low. And then to that extent, the search engine is smart enough, like uh, many uh, search engines nowadays, can really lock uh, where uh, you, uh, you are from and then the, um, uh, maintain the profile. And such, en such engines should bring it uh, back to your hometown and show the results surrounding your home uh, address. Okay. Some queries which are pretty tricky. For example, if I ask an Apple store, hmm, what does that mean? Do you mean you want to buy something like this? Okay, so that you rush to, uh, to get, uh, buy this connector so that you can give the talk, connect to the projector? Or you buy the new 
Apple products, and we know the iPhone 6, iPhone 6 Plus just came out. Or in fact, well, I, I have some new students coming, so I need to purchase some computers for my lab so that I need to connect back to my hometown, ho um, home location, right? So it's tricky. Okay. So when we tackle this problem, basically trying to uh, model uh, context and then use context to answer user questions uh, smartly, we work with a major web search engine. And we, it is well known that if you use a web search engine, then a user quite often ask multiple questions and do multiple iteration, about two rounds of interaction, uh, interaction to fulfill his or her information need. Okay? In such a case, one interesting idea we use is, uh, in fact, we use the questions in a segment, meaning uh, the consecutive questions asked by the same user as the representation of the context. So one system we built uh, back to year 2008, at that time, the word, uh, the word uh, big data is still, was still not popular yet. We built a system which can um, handle billions of queries and search at that time. Okay. And, and, and then people will think, oh, that's a huge data set. Okay. The major idea is, well, we look at the user's search log, we collect the data, and then we look at the, um, we uh, build a mathematical model um, uh, called kick through uh, by part type, and then we learn the concepts. Basically, is a concept summarizes um, different uh, um, uh, um, features of an, an information need. And then we map these uh, query um, you know, sections with their uh, intents and build a recommendation system so that um, when a search engine uh, have, uh, ha has a new user and it looks several queries, several questions this user asks and then can decide what the search engine should recommend. Okay? That was uh, done by my uh, several uh, students and then uh, we were lucky to get the best paper award a, a few years ago. And the co concept of context is really, really useful and important. And later on, we use it in another um, setting. Well, there are many um, you know, professors, uh, students here. One trouble thing in our research is writing papers. And which part is the most difficult part to write? Review related work. Why? Because people wrote papers much faster than they read them. <laughs> right? I mean, on the topic, every year there are you know, hundreds of papers on that. How can I catch up with this speed? I'm only writing one paper. Okay? So we work with uh, Sightseer. Sightseer, if you don't know that, that's the um, uh, largest um, open, uh, free, digital library uh, in the world. And it essentially collects uh, all the um, publications about computer science and mathematics, and now it's expanding to, for example, chemistry, all the other principles. We work with uh, Sightseer people, and the idea is very simple. If you give me your write-up about your problem, and then we try to read your write-up and identify the context. Hey, this may be related to one paper you may not be aware of. So we make a recommendations there. So this one is already uh, online and then people can try it out. Okay. And we also use the uh, idea of context in other applications. For example, uh, my PhD student uh, uh, just did uh, one case study uh, last year. Uh, the idea is the following. Okay, when you look at the online advertising, for example, the ads on the search engine, uh, um, I mean, in, uh, on the uh, return results returned by search engine. It's interesting is that even for the price information, different queries or different, uh, you know, uh, um, vendors may present the price information in different ways. 
if you think about that, well, it makes good sense. For example, if you are searching a, um, you know, location, uh, a hotel in Vancouver area, if my hotel has a very low price, of course, I want to give you the, uh, the exact number, $29 per night. <laughs> Unbeatable. <laughs> but if my hotel is pretty high end, and if you look at the absolute value, well, waterfront and also close to downtown, uh, close to Stanley Park, well, I have to really ask for 200, 300, or even more, right? $200. Then how can I present myself? Of course, I should not give you the uh, uh, exact number. That doesn't help much. How about give you 30% off? That sounds much better, right? And then if you say, I really want to go to uh, SFU, okay, and it doesn't make us sense to uh, tell you uh, as if you have all kinds of uh, you know, uh, uh, different discount uh, you know, food court. No, it doesn't make sense. Instead, you really need to tell people, oh, we have different campuses. They have different courses. So you should try uh, to find the right combination of that. Right? In such a case, the price information doesn't make any difference. Instead, you need to give people other information. So we look at those factors and then find, well, in fact, uh, the context uh, in um, online advertising is a very complicated thing. It's much more than people may uh, think at the first glance. People may just think, oh, I just give you the price. That's it. No, no, no. That's more than that. So we, uh, our group, uh, work with many, many uh, such uh, industrial partners on a few several things. For example, the project uh, uh, we work with uh, on context of where um, you know, search is with Microsoft uh, when Bing was uh, under development at that time. And I'm very pleased that uh, one, on one day, Bing used uh, Vancouver, the science world, as its background. Okay. And we also work with uh, like uh, uh, Blue Cross, work with uh, SAP, Simba, the many, many companies to try to apply our data mining technology in their uh, different applications. And we also learn a lot from them. They say, oh, what are the real industrial problems and how we can help uh, them and through their product help people. Okay. So we talk about big data and in fact, you may find out most of the data you are handling is not that big. In fact, I, I, I do a web search. I try to uh, Google big data, and I also try to Google small data. <laughs> you can see the answers about small data is way more than big data. <laughs> it's even more than you Google data. By the way, I, I don't understand why these two numbers <laughs> do not sum up. <laughs> so. Why we have small data in the big data era? Well, we know we are accumulate, uh, we, we are creating um, much information as we, you know, uh, uh, as now and more and more uh, as we are uh, nowadays. Okay, and if you really look at the industry uh, bigger picture, one interesting observation is the, the following: the major giants, industry, and also the governments they take the huge advantage of big data. And after just a little while, big data in fact becomes a very good protector for them, for their business, because other people cannot really uh, easily enter the uh, domain because they don't have the background knowledge, they don't have the uh, modern tools to access the data, to process the data, to analyze the data. Okay? So we need to look at Small data. Small data basically is the data owned by individuals and stored in personal devices. For example, such as the, uh, your personal computers, Excel files, and those data sets can be easily processed and analyzed by you know, personal computers and by individuals. And to some extent, if you look at it, well, you have your medical history. Right? If you look at the uh, major healthcare uh, companies, what they're doing, they just collect your information. 
And then, by the way, uh, since I collect your information, you cannot take it back. If you take it back, you need to pay me. So you can see the big data is really you know, consisting of a huge number of those small pieces. Okay. And one idea we are thinking is that, well, whether we can enable people to you know, access the data freely, individually, and also collaboratively, okay? And I want to tell you that in building uh, capitalized on big data is not that difficult. It's very simple. Let me give you a very quick example. Suppose you want to compare the air con uh, quality in different cities. This came to my mind during this uh, spring when I traveled a little bit. And one observation here is that, well, we have a pretty uh, dense population here, 100, more than 100 people uh, in this small room, but we don't have too many those tissue boxes. I do not see one. What does that mean? That means the air quality here is good. And if you travel to a place have heavy pollution, you expect a lot of such boxes there, right? Okay. In other words, everyone can take, uh, can collect data from a unique angle, and then put those data together to form a network and share the analytical results, and that's the big data application. To that extent, big data application does not need really a supercomputer to do that. Okay. May not need that. I mean, in some scenario, you need to do that. And another interesting uh, story, and uh, I hope uh, some of you uh, watched this movie in the past, is called uh, Nimitness. The idea is that the, um, the guy there um, in Wall Street, he collects all the information from Twitter, from uh, those social media, okay? And then at the, uh, analyze the data, and then to predict the trend in Wall Street. And of course, it became very rich. And that, that story, in fact, gives a very good hint and say, well, many things are collected because they are connected. If you pay attention, you collect them and analyze them in the right way, you will gain. Okay. And another, um, I want to um, uh, you know, tell you another story is that the uh, recently service of pharmacy uh, campus by Blue Cross. It is a very nice idea. Okay. It just collects people's uh, history of buying uh, medicine at different places. And whenever you have a new prescription, it can tell you where to fill the pre uh, prescription. Oh, this is a good engagement of technology to people, of uh, engagement with uh, of, um, da uh, big data with people. And uh, you can see there are a lot of uh, good um, you know, response about that. So let me tell you one more example about the uh, big data thing. And big data makes one know himself or himself much better. And there is a statistic saying 57% of the American adults search themselves on the internet. And the good news is that those people are better paid than those who haven't done so. <laughs> but I, I, I always like to use this example to, in my class to tell people correlation and consolidate are two different things. And this is just a correlation. It happens, these two things are correlated. But don't you know, blame me. Um, say, oh, tonight I search myself 10 times, but tomorrow my salary is still the same. <laughs> the consolidate is a different story. Okay. So this egocentric analysis becomes more and more important than big data. For example, uh, the, uh, the major idea of, uh, uh, is that, say, one wants to know how the person is different from uh, the others. Different can be more uh, uh, better than in more often than not, in that sense, okay? And particularly, no, I, I'm not satisfied 
by knowing I'm better than someone else, I also want to know in what aspects I'm better. So one idea we developed, uh, in fact, uh, the paper was just published uh, several months ago, is the following. OK, we try to find, for given a set of objects, we try to find the aspects that this object is better than the others, or is close to some uh, you know, uh, ideal case than the others. Okay? And this has uh, uh, immediate applications in, for example, healthcare. If you just think about uh, someone uh, of some kind of disease, you may want to know from on which aspects this case is close to one disease and different from the others. Okay? Then how the uh, medical doctor to make a, a better judgment. So by telling all these uh, stories, I think the uh, important thing I want to uh, say is that, yeah, there is a famous book, it's called uh, The Median is the Message. To some extent, big data is a media now. And what I want to say is big data itself changed our life. This is more important than the content of big data. This is more important than a specific application we develop for big data. And from now on, our culture will change. Everyone is so proactive in collecting data, sharing data with people, and make decisions based on a lot of data. So we are working on uh, engaging big data with everyone. Uh, when, we, when I say we, in fact, we have a group of people uh, with different backgrounds. Uh, we have people, uh, professors from statistics, from computing, from visual analytics, from communication, business, uh, around SFU. I really feel lucky that uh, I'm here uh, in such a context. We just, in fact, uh, submitted a proposal to CTEF talking about our dream of building a platform so that uh, we, can, we can enable people to exchange uh, big data exchange their analysis results and make debate because based on the data, we can, you know, different people may derive different answers. There's a famous term about data mining. What's data mining? Data mining is that you torture the data to get the result, okay? And, well, why a good data miner is valuable? Because he knows many tricks to torture the data hard enough to get the result. However, if you re really torture the data hard, very, very hard, you can get any result you want. Right? So, big data is a good media to support you know, more uh, justifiable, verifiable debates, and also the knowledge integration. So, so this is a, a major idea uh, uh, we uh, want to pursue, and we in this, see a lot of uh, industry and uh, collaboration, uh, for example, with healthcare, I just mentioned, network security, uh, sports analytics, all those things. There are a lot of data shared by many, many parties, and they need to uh, you know, uh, integrate them and share them. And such a platform can be used as, uh, by the community and can also be used by industry as an in, uh, in, um, inter, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, Platform, so uh, the company use it within the uh, within the organization to share the information. Okay, and these will have collaboration with uh, many other countries. We have international collaboration. Okay, and we are also uh, developing the uh, big data um, and the, uh, graduate training certificate program, which will not only teach students uh, big data knowledge, but also train them in real projects. And as uh, our president just mentioned, um, computing science, uh, School of Computing Science just uh, launched this uh, big data uh, master's uh, professional program. It is the first kind in Canada. And in this program, basically, um, we will uh, get the students to uh, take the courses in 16 months. Um, and then uh, we cover uh, 
a wide spectrum of the big data science, including algorithms, uh, tools, including machine learning tools and data mining tools, uh, systems, industry experience. And I want to highlight the industry experience because the students will be put into co-op so that they can really get the first hand experience about big data applications and challenges in real environment. And I would also like to um, hi highlight the um, visual analytics uh, research and, uh, in our university. And we have the uh, excellent uh, you know, setting for uh, visual analytics. We uh, work with uh, industry to uh, create several uh, vehicles that students can really get trained and uh, be put into real projects for the uh, visual analytics, which is a critical tool for big data uh, analysis. Okay. Now, let me uh, tell you more about how to uh, engage uh, big data with people and how big data may change our life. Okay? And this is uh, news, uh, a piece of news uh, just came out uh, early this year in ABC News. Okay? The gentleman here was a graduating PhD student, and when he was finishing his uh, PhD thesis about big data and cloud computing, he got a lot of time to wait for the results came out, uh, come out from the uh, cloud computer, cloud computing. So, and also he didn't have a girlfriend at the time. <laughs> he decided to take the time to find a girlfriend. And of course, he's a data scientist. He had to do it in a data science way. <laughs> so he used data about many people. In this specific case, he just used social media to collect about 20,000 women in this Los Angeles uh, area. Well, he is very smart. He doesn't uh, you know, collect data uh, blindly. He only very really focused. And then he do the data uh, features, uh, extraction, uh, datafication, and then do the ranking and machine learning algorithm to divide the um, you know, uh, women in, um, under you know, uh, study into several groups. And then he needs to do experiments. <laughs> the experiment is to date according to the list list. And whenever he dated uh, a girl, he learned something, oh, no, no, no. This feature is not that useful for my case. I need to tune it. <laughs> so he updated the ranked list, improved his algorithm. Oh, this is a beautiful st uh, you know, uh, story about how a data scientist make the data work. Okay. And in this case, specific case, in fact, uh, Chris uh, dated 88 girls until he met Christine Wang, the, the girl here. And I particularly like these two um, you know, sentences they said. Well, Chris said, it is not like we match and therefore we have a great relationship. That means data really help us to narrow down our search scope, give us some candidates. But the data itself is just a mechanism to put people together, okay? And Christine also said, people are much more complicated than their profiles. No matter how much data you get, you only get part of the real world, okay? So uh, she said, so the way we met was kind of superficial, but everything that happened after is not superficial at all. It has been uh, cultivated through a lot of work. What that mean? That means, after all, data is just, big data is just data. And our task as data scientists is really to collect big data with people and make data useful for people to take actions. So, to wrap up, I really like what uh, Satya uh, said, is that our industry does not respect tradition. It only respects innovation. I think big data nowadays is the arguably one of the largest innovations we are experiencing. So we need to take this trend. Yeah, thank you very much. So there's an opportunity now, and after that presentation, there must be questions. 
but not just how to narrow down your data set for dating. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to make like Phil Donahue here. I have the right color hair. Yeah. And if anyone has a question, I'll come around and we'll have time for a few questions around the room and I'll try to get around the room as best I can uh, if you have a question for Professor Pei. So who's going to be first? Ah, uh, there's a question back over here. You're always making a challenge in here. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Pai, for a very interesting, uh, engaging, and stimulating lecture. And you, in fact, uh, in some senses, preempted my question, um, which I thought I, you know, with which I was planning to sort of unsettle your uh, basic premise. And that was when you say that uh, uh, data mining mm -hmm. is ultimately, uh, you problematized that particular issue. So if you could just dwell a little on that. Uh, uh, how do you, because we're talking about uh, using uh, big data, uh, uh, you know, uh, connecting big data to people. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do we ensure uh, that we as citizens become gatekeepers to the data not being misused? And um, what is its relationship to truth then? Okay. I know you already did in some senses answer that, but if you could just elaborate. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, thank you for this. is a great question, and this is uh, one of the most difficult questions that data mining people don't know how to answer. Okay. Uh, I mean, let, let me uh, um, say um, a little bit more. Well, uh, data mining or big data analysis uh, and uh, privacy and those things are always two ends of the you know same thing, and you have to control the trade-off. Between them, and these trade of people at the very beginning thing, th thing it may be technical. So you can set up some uh, threshold and say, okay, if you cross this boundary, then it is privacy leaking. Otherwise, it's okay. But people later on find, no, 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 no. This is much more complicated than that. It is related to culture, related to your age, related to generation. Let me give you a concrete example. Um, for my parents, they don't feel comfortable that you ask me, uh, uh, you ask them for your address and uh, you send some samples to them. No, 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 no. I don't want your samples. I don't want to give you my address. For my generation, it's fine. I can sh give you my address but anyway because the telephone companies will uh, sell my address anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But I won't feel comfortable to put, for example, my daughter's pictures on the web because you don't know when they become 18 years old whether they like it or not. Okay? And what? You, you want me to, uh, to uh, provide all my profile information for you to just for two pieces of music? No, no way. I don't do that. But you can imagine for the teenagers or even younger, oh, free music. That's all. I mean, whatever you want, take it. <laughs> so, so you can see this is really a, a real question that, um, well, technical people can do something to predict if we have a specification. Say, okay, you want to make sure uh, any individual cannot be identified uniquely with this amount of information or with uh, some kind of background, uh, background knowledge. However, who will give that specification is really a complicated uh, you know, process, and it needs a lot from social science uh, to look at the problem. So to that extent, I'm sorry I cannot answer your question, but I just want to anchor uh, uh, your, uh, the challenge you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Who else has a question here? Right back here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm uh, studying upstairs in the public policy program. Mm -hmm. And I spent this summer working for the federal government in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And Ottawa is very interested in big data. <laughs> and I wanted to, and so I have lots of potential questions, but I wanted to ask you to comment a bit about the relationship between government and big data, and maybe in your own work and research, or your perception of that relationship. Okay, uh, so government, uh, at the first place, is one user of big data. And government is at a very unique 
uh, advantageous uh, position to collect data and make use of data. And, but at the same time, we see uh, some good um, you know, um, initiatives that the government put the data, release the data for public use, and also set up some regulations, say uh, some kind of data cannot be used by, for example, uh, commercial uh, companies, but can only be used for, uh, for social good. So this is a very good trend uh, we, we are uh, seeing. And uh, I think um, we are just at the very beginning of this big data era. Uh, so people are still um, you know, focus, in my personal opinion, too much on the technical part. Uh, say, well, how, how we can handle big data if I don't have a server, what can we do? And how we can buy the computational power uh, from uh, some companies, some cloud uh, service uh, companies. But the even much, much bigger challenge will be on the social part. It's say how we, should, we can moderate, uh, coordinate, and control the data sources so that we can guarantee everyone can share at least some you know, benefit from the big data. Just like uh, if we have, uh, say, minimum uh, you know, uh, income rate, minimum uh, hourly uh, salary rate, right? We should also have something to say, oh, if this data is made public, is, uh, is collected, then the people sh uh, contributed to the data should get something, should be benefited uh, in, some, in some way, in one way or the other. So, uh, and also uh, data, uh, personal data, should be, uh, you know, prized and should be um, exchangeable in some way. And this is a wide uh, open problem. There's uh, already some uh, research into that, but uh, it's relatively, it's not as much as uh, people looking at computation, uh, looking at storage, those things. Yeah. Okay. Who else has a question? I see a gentleman I know, because he shows up very regularly at public square <laughs> events. <laughs> Sure as. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing. I grew up with 10 siblings, so I know what is big data. <laughs> <laughs> My question is about training mm -hmm. children, educating children about the big data, because mm -hmm. what age would you recommend children should be exposed to computers or big data? Because there is a, only 24 hours a day, and then if they go after big data, the children they miss out all their time with parents and grandparents. So I'm just worried about the human face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. uh, data exchange. Okay, uh, that's a uh, very good question. Uh, so that's my personal opinion. Uh, I, I think as many people may think wrong, is that big data is, if, is, not, uh, is orthogonal to computers. Big data is orthogonal to computers. Big data and computers are not tying up together. Okay, the important thing is that our, uh, the, the grand change is that when we teach our kids, we need to teach them the idea about information, about information sharing at a very early stage, and about the value of information. That should be taught much earlier than we talk about programming, we talk about computation, these things. And um, one idea uh, I and uh, several colleagues uh, uh, discussed a lot, but we did not really get time to uh, think about is that, in fact, we should teach every undergrad student computation and algorithm without using computers. Because that's the way people think. That's the way people decompose a complex problem into smaller uh, pieces and then tackle one by one. And that's the uh, way people think about how to uh, make a solution operatable. So, so uh, that's my personal uh, view. Yeah. Okay. We have another question right here and then I'll turn around and look out for others. <laughs> When I might be reading something online, newspaper, uh, an ad pops up on the side that shows some product I might have been looking at on another uh, commercial site. So I'm assuming this is done through cookies of some sort. 
Um, question of the ethics of this and possible regulation. I mean, this is probably part of how big data gets created. Yeah. Yeah. So what are ethical issues, possible regulation, and or software that will stop that kind of linking? OK. Uh, in fact, this question is really related to the first question about uh, privacy uh, issues. And I guess you must be, uh, you must have click on something, say, I agree with that. On uh, some day, long time ago, you even forgot and even did not pay attention. Because when you install a computer, they just ask you to read uh, many, many uh, documents. And they intentively or unintentively print everything in a fun size 2. <laughs> OK. By the way, uh, this is fun size 30. <laughs> so you can imagine what a fun size 2 means. Okay, and so technically is ethic and is uh, you know following the regulations, but I I know what you uh, really mean by that. You say, hey, your program is reading my you know behavior. That's scary. So it comes back to our uh, my uh, previous uh, saying. Say, well, it really depends on your age and how care uh, you are about the uh, you know uh, privacy. Okay, and this uh, this one uh, this thing is very uh, serious issue, and I uh, see a lot of uh, you know social scientists and uh, they look at the issue and they try to categorize say different levels of uh, privacy that companies should uh, respect, and there are also some technical solutions say there's some uh, search engines that they can uh, you can really control what are the cookies that are watching you and what are the cookies you can block. So to that extent, uh, one thing is important is the diversity. I mean, if we cannot stop someone doing something, diversity will uh, provide us options that we can avoid. We can go the other way. Yeah. So we have time for one or two more questions. Um, we'll do one here. And then... Thank you. Uh, this follows on from the government information question. Um, Revenue Canada can't remember where I live, even though I <laughs> send them money every year. <laughs> Home Depot knows that I bought a, a tape measure that was 25 feet long in 1997. <laughs> so obviously the data is siloed. The government has silos and they don't follow through. My question is really about search. Uh, you talked about access to information, making information available. Mm -hmm. How is search going to change for people who don't write algorithms, people like me who are dependent on a commercial search engine? How are we going to search in the future? Is that going to change in your view? Oh, thank you very much for this question. This is a great question, and uh, uh, definitely. Um, well, sooner or later, computers, uh, algorithms, those things will become like uh, Automobile. Well, I assume most of us can drive. In this, most of us in this room can drive. But very few of us may even bother to look at the engine, say how it works and how to fix the problems, right? You don't build your own car. So that's what I want to say is that uh, very soon, I believe, many people have to have some skills of using algorithm products without knowing what is going on inside the black box. For example, search is a very excellent example, as you observe. Nowadays, if you, let me give you a concrete example. If you want to buy a house at some street address, okay, in the past, you go there, look at the house, it looks nice, and then you uh, go there uh, looking around, and then maybe you know, go there three times a day, in the morning, in the afternoon, at the evening, you look at it, smell it, and see whether it's okay. But with search, you can do much more. You can search the address. Immediately, you can find out what the local, new, uh, local uh, you know, business there. And any instance, instance in the last several years, anything happened related to the, uh, that uh, area, you can get much more. So the information uh, this, uh, will become part of the bigger context in the uh, very near future, and in fact, it's happening now. And web search engine, the information access, will become a basic tools for people. The, uh, that's what I uh, mean by big data uh, is the medium. And it will change not only because the content makes us to change the way we look at houses. 
if we change our habit, if we change our culture on everything. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. This is so fascinating. Let's take two more. <laughs> Someone back here. Hi. So yeah. just to uh, expand on what you just said about the medium is a message by yeah. Marshall McLuhan that you yeah. used. Yeah. So you say the data itself doesn't matter, but it's yeah. the big data that has the impact on us. That's yeah. what you trying no, to no, say? No, uh, what I mean is that um, the data uh, content itself is not that important. Well, it is important for a specific application, important for a very specific scenario. But overall, if after 100 years, let's look back and what happened in these 10 years with these uh, awkward big data. It really, you really see is that people change the way they do things. But they change the way, for example, search engine becomes such an essential tool everyone will use. And if you look at, you know, uh, look back, 10 years ago, very few people will use search engine. When they use search engine, you look at something exactly match. You don't use that as a hint to find out more and more. You don't use, uh, you don't have things like uh, uh, Wikipedia really as an open uh, uh, knowledge base for that. And that's linked back to what we are trying to do uh, in, as an interdisciplinary effort is that we try to build something like uh, Wikipedia for big data so that people can really share the ideas and build up a community. Big, uh, based on big data. Yeah. Okay, who, uh, there was someone else with their hand over? Oh, I'll take this person here, and that person over there will be cross with me. <laughs> so location matters. <laughs> oh, I, this better be a good question now. Um, I, I think it's really interesting some of the tensions you're pointing out in that the, the future isn't written yet, and it's all very exciting. Mm -hmm. and. I saw sort of two different uh, visions, one which I see as more utopian and more dystopian than the other, in terms of some of the concerns about surveillance and uh, you know, she who controls the algorithms controls the world because we're yep. not all looking inside the black box. And on the other hand, there was, there was glimpses in your talk of a more way big data could open up as a democratizing force, connecting yep. people with it. And seeing as the, the future's not written, I'm curious what you think the I guess people working in the field of big data as well as you know, ordinary citizens can do to help push things in a direction that might be more open as opposed to big data becoming a competitive advantage controlled by just a few players. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for it. Uh, I think we need to do, um, we need to try our best to make sure big data belongs to everyone instead of just a few uh, major, so-called major players. There are several levels of uh, big data usage. The lowest level is the data generator, the data owners. And sooner or later, everyone will have uh, a lot of data. And then uh, if the competition will really to the next level is how we can put data together, how people can share data, integrate data in an effective and efficient way so that we can make good use of it. And the higher level will be who can you know, creatively cre um, build new ways to use the data. Okay. So um, to that extent, well, uh, some big companies, they really can uh, you know, gather the, the talent to do things in the short term and uh, beat the competitors and build their own uh, so, uh, edge in business. But uh, at a large scale, I believe uh, is sooner or later we need to go to the um, you know, uh, stage that we need to think about the big data infrastructure for everyone, for uh, public, for social good, so that uh, everyone can uh, contribute and also can benefit from these practices. So um, at this time, uh, big data uh, more or less uh, started from a few uh, hotspot uh, industry and it's quickly uh, expanding and more and more companies are looking at that. But uh, many, um, in many applications, uh, those uh, small players and individuals, they feel a, lot, uh, a little bit like helpless because they don't have the, um, really the uh, advantage to build their own force to uh, conquer, to tender the uh, big data. So that's the uh, good opportunity for academia to step in 
and also for cloud sourcing. I, I don't know whether this term sounds familiar to people. Basically, it's that people, everyone can contribute a little bit to build a large system that can beat every, uh, you know, the giants. Like uh, one very really successful uh, story is, is like a Linux. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to, on your behalf, uh, thank Dr. Pei for a fabulous lecture and for answering some amazing questions. <laughs> <laughs>